In a couple of weeks' time, new homeless figures for England are out spanning the last quarter of 2014. Whatever they are, the onslaught on those who sleep rough continues. The Manchester branch of Selfridges may have recently removed its so-called anti-homeless spikes. But other elements of city architecture that are meant to deter anyone from sleeping on the street still remain. Actor and writer Alex Andreo, who has previously been homeless himself, has experienced the cruelty of urban planning firsthand. He joins me now. Welcome, Alex, to Going Underground. Thank you for having me. So uh, the homeless spikes are just the start of it, then? They are. They're just the start of it because they're a very noticeable feature. Um, but once you begin to assess the city with a clear frame of mind of where do I sleep, where do I rest, where do I go to the toilet, then you begin to notice quite a lot of things that have changed, that have made the environment sort of anti-human in many ways. And it's not only on the minds of the homeless, it's very much on the minds of the planners. Oh, it's, it, it has to be because, I mean, these things are quite specifically designed. You don't get uh, a change from uh, bus shelter seats on which you can sit, you don't get to change to those sort of tiny little ones that pivot forward um, by accident. They're very specifically designed so that people can't sit on them for any length of time. Um, you, there's a particularly insidious thing going on with uh, sort of little sculptures as well. So occasionally you get benches or you get ledges that have these sculptures that interrupt the space sort of every one foot. And you think they're a design feature, but actually they're also a, a feature that prevent, pre prevents people from lying down. So if you look more closely at street furniture around, uh, around what every aspect is designed to... Not every uh, aspect, but a lot of aspects. I was recently reading a, a, a big article in a, in a sort of gardener's magazine about how there are particular types of shrubs which are very low maintenance and very thorny and they can protect small p spaces, sort of little corners and enclaves and things like that from people sleeping there. I mean... Is it very new that all public space seems to have these elements designed that are, that are anti-people? It's not, it's not new. Um, as a matter of fact, the, the concept of defensive architecture is medieval, but uh, as, a, as a, a feature of urban planning, it's certainly something that seems to me to be accelerating. It's on a, it's on a really exponential curve. Um, and I think that's because the more public space gets privatized, the more councils are squeezed um, and budgets are slashed and they're having to sell their assets. So the more they sell common land, um, the more uh, corporate entities that buy this feel that together with the shop, they buy the frontage of the shop and they just don't want homeless people to be there. And part of the land ownership creates these uh, dead cells that, that's right, because Which when they you have to protect as well. Yeah, when you when you parcel land to sell it off, you end up with little corners and little enclaves that are really too small to develop, but they're big but enough for enough someone to, to go and sleep there. And so you end up with these little problem spaces that architects are, are asked to solve. What do you think the psychological impact is of our visual space, those who aren't homeless, where uh, all of this is designed to attack uh, people who sleep rough? I, I think that even though it might wash over the conscious part of your mind, I think our bodies experience it. I think, you know, for, for soft human bodies to exist in spaces that are unwelcoming and hard, um, it makes us more hostile. Do you think people realize this or they just look at those homeless spikes and think, well, that's very obvious? I think people, people notice it because public space becomes so squeezed so that, you know, I mean, when it comes to lunchtime and you want to go somewhere outside to have a sandwich, it, be it becomes quite difficult to find space to sit. Um, and so I, I do think people notice it. I'm not entirely sure whether everyone puts two and two together and understands that's what it's targeted um, at, but I do think it, it's become so prevalent that people notice it. People There's just been, find it harder to get to a public toilet. Yeah, uh, uh, well, but, I mean, public toilets shelter. are a classic example. Um, one of the constant complaints against homeless people is the, is the fact that they urinate in public. 
And yet, if you ask someone where the nearest free public toilet is, they couldn't tell you. And as a matter of fact, there are very, very few left. This type of defensive architecture was used famously in American inner cities, and we've I think many people yeah. in Britain know what happened to those inner cities. What can be done here to stop our cities becoming uh, full of this privatized space and, and with the absence of public? I think what is needed is a change of attitude. I think what is needed is a, is it is the a cherishing of the public, public space. It's an understanding that the less public space we have, the more people friendly we have to make. But with austerity policies to bail out uh, Ironically, the city, which of course invested in the companies <laughs> that own the land you're talking about, surely uh, people will get more divided and much more, uh, they'll be looking more and more to protecting themselves yeah, I, in, in a dangerous climate. The, there's, a, there's a tendency to feel that you're in competition with people that are lower down the pecking order than you are, but there is a tendency to think that, and I think it's encouraged by the media. Um, when I published the piece, a lot of the comments, the yeah, a lot of the comments underneath were along the lines, "Well, yes, it's cruel, but I can understand. I mean, I wouldn't want someone sleeping in my doorstep." And I think that is a frame of mind. That is a very particular frame of mind of the of the post Thatcher generation, if you want, to be walking into your nice warm flat and see someone at the doorstep who has nothing. And the only question you ask yourself is how does their homelessness affect me for the 10 seconds it takes me to get into my building? That's quite a, an unsavory thing. Alexandre, thank you. Thank you. Protesters have taken over central London to demonstrate against the UK's treatment of rough sleepers. There have been reports of scuffles between the police and activists, although no injuries have been reported. The protesters are calling for no more deaths on our streets. It's part of an international campaign aiming to raise awareness of and show solidarity with those struggling on the streets. RT's Laura Burden Manley is there. Laura, tell us what's going on now where you are. Well, I'm currently in the centre of Soho. We have finished out, the protesters have finished the demonstration. Uh, now, there is a bit of a standoff currently taking place between some of the protesters and the police. There's a police van um, just beside me, and they're calling from a squat just behind me where they finished the demonstration um, for them to leave immediately. Now, it seems quite surprising the police did comply, and they started to walk away as uh, there was possibly a scuffle. So that's that's what's happening at the moment. However, earlier, um, I'll just tell you a little bit about the trajectory of the march. It started in Whitehall, just by Downing Street. The protesters blocked all of the streets um, on the way, and they marched towards um, uh, not only Parliament Square, but then Buckingham Palace. Um, part of the anger is how many empty houses there are in London where they can't house the homeless. So um, outside Buckingham Palace, they were shouting that they should occupy, and there's 40 spare bedrooms inside. Um, they then continued. Um, I'm just the, sorry, the police have literally just moved from here now. Uh, the protesters are shouting them out. So, um, so at the end of the demonstration, they then went to numerous squats. We're standing just outside of a squat just to the right of me here where there's still a few protesters, um, but it's, it's a pretty jubilant atmosphere, actually. It seems to have been quite lively this evening. What, what was the protesters' main message? Well, the main message was against the previous coalition government. They didn't believe they were doing enough in order to combat homelessness in the UK. So I'm just going to give you some of the figures that will be on the screen now. Uh, the organisers said homelessness has ri risen by a staggering 55% since the coalition government came into power. So they want the next um, government to actually make some of these changes. Um, 742 people are sleeping rough on a nightly basis on the streets in London. Um, currently there are uh, there's 1.88 billion pounds being spent um, to try to hope, like, temporarily house homeless people in the UK. Um, so this is obviously a big issue as it could actually 
build an additional 72,000 homes um, in London alone. And finally, it's the children. There is a big message here tonight for them. There are 76,790 children who are in tem temporary accommodation. And they said, being one of the richest countries in the world, we can home at least the children. So this is a, one of their serious messages today. Um, however, they said the quantifying homelessness is a very difficult task, considering there are many forgotten homelessness, homeless people on the street. So um, they're currently talking about the hashtags, and this is actually what helped to organize the demonstration. So it's a, an amalgamation of many different political groups here. RT's Laura Bird and Manley there. Thank you. Well, joining me now for more on this is Just In Time, a project manager for Homeless Reach, which is a service that provides essentials to those experiencing homelessness, and also John Glackin, who's the coordinator of Streets Kitchen and an, organization, and an organizer for the London March for the Homeless. John, I'm going to come to you first, if you don't mind. Has there been a change in the type of people who use your services recently? The biggest change in the types of people we're seeing Using our services, the numbers, we're seeing vast amounts more people coming using our streets, kitchens, coming to get basic needs like food, sanitary products, things that people might consider to be luxuries. And what is quite shocking is quite a few of these people actually are in employment. They're not necessarily homeless, the people who are working on minimum wages. But having said that, we are seeing quite a, a large, considerable large, more number of people who are actually street homeless. People are sofa surfing. I mean, there's uh, chaos out in those streets. I mean, the homeless figures, as you see them on official figures, they're nowhere near the truth. I mean, I'm sure as Justin would be able to tell you, I mean, he's somebody else out there in the we'll streets. We'll come to the figures certainly in a minute, but Justin, you were nodding along there. Is that something that you can identify with? Definitely, 100%. It's like we're seeing homelessness on an increase, and that's because of things like social cleansing and just just the prices of rent going up, people not being able to maintain paying their rent, their bills. Like A lot of people are just one paycheck away from being homeless themselves. So. And you see a lot of people who are employed as well? On a weekly basis as well, there's people with jobs out there, but they just can't maintain a roof over their heads for whatever reasons. So There is lots of support out there for the homeless though, right? So um, day centres, hostels, uh, soup kitchens like the one that you, you are organising, is that, is that not enough? It's not enough. There isn't enough day centres. And even with that, I mean, there's certain rules and regulations to access day centres. I mean, there's these, so what I would call them as poverty pimps. I mean, there is a whole industry that's created to make money out of homeless people, exactly. funded by councils. I mean, day centres, quite a few people don't want to go to day centres because so many rules, regulations. Now, of course, there has to be human, you know, there has to be rules and regulations in terms of alcohol and conduct and stuff. But in terms of, you know, dress code, in terms of, actually, if you smell too much, you shouldn't be, you're not allowed to come into a day centre. And these are services that are supposed to provide uh, those basic needs. I mean, there's a whole lot of issues that today hopefully has rose that we will continue to raise. I mean, there isn't enough day centres, and the day centres that are run, quite a few of them, there are some brilliant day centres in London, there's quite brilliant day centres in the UK, but uh, there's not enough of them. Um, just in all of the political parties, all of the major political parties have made pledges as far as homelessness is concerned, without singling any one of them out. Um, what are your hopes for the future? I mean, we're coming up to a general election. What, what, do you, what do you hope and want to happen? What I would like to see is many of the places that have been boarded up due to things like health and safety reasons, I'd like to see them opened up and renovated so they're made available for people to live in. As for people that are on the streets, I'd like to see us take, in, take on the housing first approach, like kind of what they did in Ohio. So you take people directly off the streets, put them into a home, and then if they need things like drug counselling or other stuff, provide those services after, where instead of providing them prior to housing the individual. Um, talking about society's attitude towards the homeless, um, we've, we've heard Laura talking this evening at the march about um, spikes being placed outside buildings and areas being watered down, um, presum uh, presumably so that homeless people can't sleep there. But surely a city where we have a lot of rough sleepers lying around is not really a city that anyone wants to live in. I mean, aren't people obliged to do these things, really? Well, it's not that they're obliged to do it. I mean... 
They do it. I mean, they've actually criminalised under Operation Encompass, brought in by the Metropolitan Police with the compliance of property pimps and the compliance of six boroughs in London, where it's now illegal to commit the, the, the heinous crime of rough sleeping. I mean, it's strange. I mean, I'm, I'm watching just your intro to um, you're showing these people who look boisterous, they look like, you know, it looks dangerous. We, we had a wonderful march, a brilliant march. I can understand the anger of some of those people today. I mean, half five this morning, their windows were broke through illegally by bailiffs. They were kicked out of a squat, and from that squat, we were able to, you know, um, cook food, we were able to service the homeless community. So there's some anger against the police, and quite justifiably. I mean, these are the same police force that are criminalising rough sleepers. So, I mean, it would be good if media could actually maybe Stop concentrating on things like this. It does look a bit boisterous and whatnot. And actually look at the real issues that are going on. I mean, if, that, if those cameras want to walk around Soho just a few minutes away, they'll see rough sleepers. I mean, that's what we need to be talking about. I mean, talking about, you know, a boisterous behaviour and understandable anger at the police. And the police have moved away because squatting is still legal. And we hope and we c hope it continues to be. I mean, for example, there's 10 empty homes available for one homeless family, UK-wide. I mean, that's ridiculous. These homes or these buildings need to be opened again. I mean, I know me and Justin, we want to talk to councils, and I would encourage councils to start speaking to Homeless Streets and Streets Kitchen to give us empty properties that the council own, rather than selling them off for profit, rather than giving them to wealthy speculators, rather than giving it to people who won't live in those premises, like Chinese oligarchs or Russian oligarchs. No, give us a chance and tell you what, we can actually make a big change in life. OK, John and Justin, we're going to have to leave it there, but thank you very much for coming in and telling us the real story. We really appreciate it. The government is falling short on its promise to battle a housing crisis across England. As new figures show, there's been an average shortage of over 60,000 homes built each year. The National Audit Office is calling for more to be done, as the number of homeless people in the country stands at over a quarter of a million. At the same time, buildings sit empty for years, and one group in Oxford is determined to make use of them. But they're facing a legal challenge. RTK's Issa Ali explains. This building is uh, changed life, you know, but we have everything now, hot water, energy, not rain, uh, and no problem now, find a job and change life. That's the impact this previously empty building in Oxford is having on the lives of the city's homeless community after it was occupied by campaigners and turned into free accommodation over the cold winter months. Temperatures have already reached sub-zero levels. Organisers of this occupation say that this place provides shelter and a place to rest, but that it also points to a deeper problem of the housing crisis here in Oxford. Can't wait for someone else to open up a, a shelter. So a group of us decided it was time to do it ourselves. Elise is one of a number of local residents leading the occupation and conversion of the building into a shelter. She points to the difference it's making to the lives of the homeless in Oxford. The big... Um, stumbling point for people who are homeless is moving on with, with any kind of employment or going into further education is difficult if you don't have an address. And this, this provides an address even if it is temporary. We have a lot of skilled people living here and we have people who have jobs who are, who are homeless. Um, we have a couple of chefs. So it, it really is ordinary people being affected by the housing problem now. Ifley House is owned by Oxford University and is one of up to 300 thought to be lying empty in the city, while local homelessness had soared 50% at the last official count just over a year ago. The building's due to be demolished to make way for new student accommodation and has been lying empty for months. Yet the Mid-Counties co-op group who rent the ground floor of the building began legal action to kick out the homeless people living there. But after a standoff with the organisers, they appeared to back down. They told RT... We're very confident that we can agree an amicable arrangement which allows Ifley Open House to operate as a homeless shelter until we're legally required to hand the site back to our landlord. As a cooperative society and supporter of the gatehouse here in Oxford, it was really important to us that we reach the right outcome for the people staying at the Ifley Open House. We're very confident of reaching a successful agreement. Despite this, the co-op will request a repossession order at court tomorrow to ensure, they say, those staying in the building leave when the lease expires at the end of April. But the organisers remain cautious. Tomorrow's hearing means they could face eviction, 
but they vow to keep fighting. For Radek and his friends, though, the more time they're allowed in this makeshift shelter, the better. Come see your bedroom. Yeah, yeah. You know, we're leaving a street and leaving, uh, after we're leaving a, a tent. Uh, but now we have a bedroom and it's uh, better. Uh, we are looking uh, now a uh, job, a uh, work, and starting a new life. This bedroom has changed my life and my friend's life. Issa Ali, RT, in Oxford. Bournemouth is a haven for tourism, but local entrepreneurs argue that the homelessness epidemic is a hindrance to their businesses. To tackle the crisis, authorities are now spending hundreds of thousands of pounds on an initiative to send rough sleepers back to their hometowns. RTK's Harry Fear finds out more. So beautiful Bournemouth by the seaside is investing almost £200,000 in a new crackdown on homelessness. It's paying for one-way rail tickets for rough sleepers to go elsewhere. It's part of the council's policy, assertive engagement. It's hired two new staff onto its rough sleepers team who wouldn't talk to RT. One is tasked with encouraging the homeless to move along, supposedly reconnect with family or friends elsewhere. Well, if they're going back home, I guess that's good. So they're basically giving it to somebody else to be their problem. Short-sighted and a bit selfish. It's Steve's job to increase footfall into shops. He runs the centre's business improvement district. He says rough sleeping is a big problem. It's really inappropriate for the business community, I think. They congregate in the town centre uh, and they're sleeping in shop doorways, not only at night, but during the day. It's really just saying to these people that, look, you know, if you're from Liverpool or Leeds or Bristol, if you go back to where you're from, then you can get some help. Well, in my case, there's nowhere to go. They would send me back to somewhere I had a local connection, but my family don't live in this country. Matthew was a taxpayer. He spent the last 10 years on and off homeless. Great for business, great Great for tourism, not great for the council when the tourists see all the homeless people and realise that maybe there might be something wrong with Bournemouth and Bournemouth Council of Housing Policy. The council tells RT it wants to help individuals' issues for the long term and that reconnection can be best to help some get the services they need. On housing, it says it has also increased funding for rent deposits. But the council's been in trouble before. Last year, it was petitioned by thousands to stop playing bagpipes music and Alvin and the Chipmunks during the night to drive away rough sleepers. One expert suggests aggressive policies hurt the homeless, risking their safety and mental health, and that there's another way, that those affected work together. We found that the local community um, in, the, in most of the boroughs that we've worked in actually supports the rough sleepers. So it was setting up that they would go a little bit further away from the cash point machines so people weren't being worried. It was just sharing the information and the insight of what the local community and the businesses are concerned about, which is around their welfare, and the rough sleepers, their concerns about not being too far away from being able to, to be seen for their safety and welfare. So in reality, the concerns are exactly the same. It's just all the sides are not talking to each other. Ultimately, for Matthew, the train fare scheme feels really just like the latest bullying scheme. They're not going to be handing out many train tickets because people haven't got anywhere to go. If they had somewhere to go, they'd go there. If they're sleeping in a shop doorway, it means they've run out of options. It's not a case of get on a train, there's somewhere I can be. You know, all you've got to do is walk to the motorway, get your thumb out, hitch to where you wanted to be. If there was somewhere you had to go, you'd be there. You wouldn't be sleeping in a doorway with one eye open, terrified someone was going to pee on you or hit you, which is what happens. Harry Fear, RTUK, Bournemouth. Just a few weeks ago, the empty bank housed a support centre for Liverpool's homeless community. They used the location as a place to sleep, an advice centre and a street kitchen. The love activists say they simply wanted to look after those sleeping rough. But a judge at Liverpool's magistrate's court branded the three-week occupation a self-indulgent vanity project. Five of them were thrown in jail. There's a community here that needs support. And why can't we use this building that belongs to somebody else miles and miles away? And they just want to leave it empty for their own profit. 
and um, my son decided to stay in once the doors were shut and the police were outside and he said the policemen were saying if you come out now you won't be arrested James chose to stay he, he chose to highlight the cause with two of the activists still in prison and two in a young offenders institution their message is clear focusing on the lack of support for the homeless questioning abandoned property in the UK and government austerity. So Chelsea, you were sentenced to 10 weeks. You did just one week and were released on appeal because you weren't a political activist. Is that right? That's right, yeah. Um, I went in for somewhere to sleep at the time because I was homeless um, and I wanted to kind of help out with other homeless people because um, when I was younger, I always dreamed of helping out at soup kitchens and things like that. And what do you think of the others who were still inside? I think it's awful. They went in there to help people. Um, it's an empty building, they didn't do any harm in there. And they helped so many people, they don't deserve what they've got. Liverpool has seen a 32% increase in those sleeping rough in the last three years. And the local council blames government cuts for the rise. We've got major problems coming along, I think, Martin. Um, the welfare reforms trailed in the July budgets by the, the government. are going to uh, reduce the benefit cap. They're going to bring lots of changes to welfare. And we, we're worried that there are some vulnerable citizens in the city who will be impacted on that. And we're worried about evictions, possibly from social housing. So we've got to be prepared for those changes. Although squatting in a non-residential building isn't in itself a crime, this anti-austerity protest cost the police almost £100,000. Damage caused to the Grade 1 listed structure is also estimated to have come to £46,000. Political messages come at a cost. But it's a cost that seems to be something Liverpool's love activists are prepared to pay the price for. Britain, which was once proud of having some of the most effective legislation in the world to fend off homelessness, now has over 50,000 people sleeping rough. And with the government ushering in public sector spending cuts in an attempt to battle the country's financial troubles, the number of homeless people is expected to rise. Archie's Polly Boyko went to meet some of those living on the streets. It's freezing. You're cold, wet and hungry. There's nowhere for you to go to dry off and no money in your pockets. This street is all you've got and there's no one that will help you. Welcome to Birmingham, the UK's capital for homelessness. My name is Michael. I've been homeless now for two years on the streets of Birmingham. In the city centre of Birmingham, I don't know how many homeless people it is, but it's a hell of a lot. And we shouldn't be homeless. A lot of people do come here after a certain time. Underneath, we, we have got a car park where people sleep all over the places. This is where I got attacked. In the very yeah, centre in the, of in this, Yes, in the middle of here. Michael is by no means alone. In fact, the number of homeless people in Britain has skyrocketed by 25% since 2010, reaching 50,000 people in 2012. The biggest spike in the city of Birmingham. You don't know who could be going for your pockets, who could be walking past you. I mean, you could be sleeping next to a wall, some druggie could come up, throw up all over you. I mean, it's horrible. And the coldness is stupid, especially this time of year. We had to go about three, four days with nothing to eat. 21-year-old Matt fled his family home where he came to blows with his stepfather. He had to sleep rough before being granted emergency shelter in a Birmingham hostel. It's run by a charity that helps anyone down and out find employment and get back on their feet. I'm always looking for work and whatnot because I'm, I'm on the dole now. Like. I haven't got no job or anything like that at the moment, which I'm trying to get. It's Daniel's second stay at the hostel in three years. After growing up in and out of foster care, he struggled to keep a roof over his head. You've got to do whatever it takes to find somewhere to sleep, find money, <laughs> help and support. It's a scary thing, waking up knowing that you've still got to face it all over again. There just isn't enough low-cost housing available. And with unemployment rising, hostels just like this one desperately need to expand. The figures from the local authority of people presenting as homeless have increased on average by about 400% a month. For the growing homeless community, squatting in one of the city's 12,000 empty homes used to be an option. Not anymore.
just before the winter set in, Westminster upgraded squatting from a civil matter to a criminal offence. Predictions that it would translate to more rough sleepers on the streets came true. There are a lot of deprived areas in Birmingham. There are a lot of people that don't have work in Birmingham, and I suppose with it being such, at one time, an industrialised centre, there are working class families, but those jobs just don't exist anymore. So I suppose that the, the poverty is just sort of breeding further poverty. And there is, there is a big mix of people in Birmingham. The population's expanding, the housing stock isn't. You know, it's reached that point where it's just spilling over and, and can't cope anymore. And with more government budget cuts kicking in after April, many more Britons are predicted to slip through the net as the housing crisis escalates. Polly Boyko, RT, Birmingham. Four anti-begging posters linking homelessness to drug use, fraud and alcoholism have been banned by the Advertising Standards Agency. The initiative set up by Nottingham City Council urged members of the public not to give money to rough sleepers. Seven complaints were received by the watchdog, which concluded the posters had reinforced stereotypes and were likely to cause serious offence. The local authority denies the campaign depicted homeless people negatively, despite more than 2,000 petitioners claiming otherwise. Well, this isn't the first time Nottingham Council has been criticised for its tough approach to rough sleepers, and it's not alone. RTK's Harry Fear takes a look at aggressive tactics used by local authorities. Well, yeah, I mean, rough sleeping's been increasing kind of year on year, really, since about 2010. As those services are cut, as the safety net is taken away, people are hitting the street in more crisis. In Nottingham, rough sleeping's now at an almost 20-year high. Since 1998, it's the highest figures we've ever had. It's the last six months, really. I think that's been the shocking, the, the largest increase, really. But the city's not alone. Across Britain, rough sleeping's increased steeply by 30% in the last year. Homelessness is rising in some areas. What then are the frontline challenges faced by rough sleepers in this era of austerity? Well, there is a nationwide theme dealing with the latest aggressive tactics by local authorities. Among them, the seizing destroying of sleeping bags. They take your blankets, they take your sleeping bags. The other day, all the people that sleep under the tree, they had all their stuff taken away, thrown away in bags and put onto the van that comes past. So rough sleepers often hide their possessions during waking hours, but they're still sought out. In front of us are two people in high-vis jackets who have just been looking for people's things. So, so this sort of air conditioning unit, can you see it's got like three feet to the wall? You think from the front it's stuck to the wall? Sure, sure. They know it isn't, so they can hide their things behind their ID, paperwork. It's all being destroyed. So, which then means we're back to square one, which could mean for somebody another six months on the streets. So why the designs to destroy? Part of it is health and safety. When you're hiding your stuff so close to a children's playground, all you need is one inquisitive child to run around the corner and then they've pricked themselves. And the other part is just this continuous sort of agitation so people don't settle anywhere. Sounds like being actively unhelpful is the modus operandi. They're not getting help with their benefits. They're not getting help with any knowledge or learning classes. They're scorned on about carrying possessions. You can't sit there. You can only sit over there. You can't congregate. And this comes from the police. This comes from the councils. This comes from private security firms. This is a tactic and a policy employed to try and get rid of homelessness. Like, out of sight, out of mind. Some councils are destroying rough sleepers' tents using public space protection orders to ban sleeping in doorways and sitting near cash machines. Others are fining those that beg £50, refusing to register the homeless and instead handing out how to survive on the street leaflets or telling clients to search Google for a solution to their problems. Other councils do better. Nationwide, there's a hodgepodge of prevention, support, enforcement. This, quote, unacceptable variation was criticised in a parliamentary report last month. It blasted some authorities' approaches. We understand the difficult financial pressures they are under and the difficult choices they have to make, but treating someone as a human does not cost money. We have received too much evidence of staff treating homeless people in ways that are dismissive and at times discriminatory. This is unacceptable. 
The government, though, stands firm. Statutory homelessness remains less than half the 2003-04 peak. However, one person without a home is one too many. The government is investing more than 500 million to prevent and tackle homelessness. But successive government policy failures have critical consequences for those who are some of the country's most vulnerable. A survey in the capital recently found a third had been attacked or beaten up. It's not a joke. Last year, for example, 196 people that we know of died homeless in London. What a kind of society do we live in? Harry Fear, RT, London. Sleeping on the streets can be extremely dangerous, and one homeless man found this out the hard way after he was beaten and robbed in a series of assaults over the course of just one week. We spoke to Chris Main to find out more about his recent ordeal. I was asleep here, I put my head down, I was quite tired, it was about half two in the morning, and I woke up because Cookie was kicking off. And I sort of dazed because he was barking, and I saw someone with my case going down the street. All my, my stuff had gone. My chalks, my oils, my acrylics, paints, canvases, done ones, blank ones. I just felt devastated. Um, I cried. It's been a struggle for the last nearly couple of weeks. I've had cars drive up and you, Ryan, chucked at me. Me and my friend, Gary, we were, we were sitting there one day, we got spat on from a car, and there was some fighting, and there were some drunk people. And when they came out of the pub, they just decided to have a go at me and Cookie. And as I was drawing, they booted me in the, in the head. That was the Friday. And then on the Saturday, someone put a pint glass there. And I said, can you move your pint glass? And he came back and he spat on me and Cookie then. So later on in the night, it was the same people but in a car. And I drove there and they chucked a pint glass at me. And it smashed off there. It got me there, cut on my face where the glass and it caught Cookie. And they drove off, calling me a dirty tramp. So. Well, it seems a helping hand is always in reach, and some locals have since decided to set up a crowdfunding page to help Chris get back on his feet, hoping to reach £5,000. The money will help go towards new clothes, food and painting materials. My name's Simon Wood, and I'm 41 years of age. My name is Peter Finnegan, and I'm, tw and I'm 34 years old. I first became homeless through drinking. I had a drink problem. Left children's homes at 15. Out into the street, that was it. This, this, lovely, this lovely young woman, um, she seen me upset and distraught and that. And she asked me what was up and I explained that my shoes had fell apart from the rain and someone's robbed me stuff again. And it's, it's just a goddamn joke. I've even had cardboard rock from underneath me. It's really bad. Are you addicted to any drugs? No. No, just alcohol? Yeah. yeah. Are you addicted to any, any drugs? No. No? Alcohol? No. No? And how many years have you been without home? Uh, on and off, 20 years plus. 20 years plus. Now, uh, about five years. Well, thank you very much for doing this. Uh, it is, it is great of you. I just want someone to do it for me, so... Yeah, um, no, I help back. I got I got do you know what I mean? But I used to do work that anyway, mate. My name is Alexander Georgiev and I'm 17 years old. Right, how much of a problem do you think homelessness is in the UK? Uh, I actually think it, it is a bit of a great deal because uh, there are a lot of people who are unfortunately uh, not fortunate enough to have homes and in a, in a current situation, they're just outside and under the shelter of the sky, that's the, the only thing. But yeah, I, I think unfortunately that I can still see that it's, you know, it's inhumane, inhumane to help people, which is kind of fearful in my opinion. 
I think it's a, um, it's a big problem because we're supposed to be living in one of the, um, the most richest countries in the world. And uh, for the most richest country, uh, one of the most richest countries, um, there's a lot of homeless people. Do you ever give money to the homeless? Yeah, I, um, yeah, I do give um, money to the homeless people because um, there was a stage in my life when I used to be homeless, um, so I know what it's like when you've got nowhere to stay. Um, when, when you got, when you, if you haven't got an address, you can't get any benefits, so it can be really hard for you being homeless. What is the, com the most common misconception about homeless people? Is that we're all drug takers and drug users. Uh, drugs. Drugs, yeah. 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 And recently, spice. Right. Uh, do you think homeless people take drugs? Uh, not all, definitely not all, but um, I'd say a quite a large percentage if we're including alcohol in that. So I usually give out free haircuts. There was a dude around here yesterday who came in and had a shower and everything, got free haircuts. So have you got like a, a oh, shop or something? Free haircuts, aren't you? Well, I've only done him. Oh, it's called Wayne. Joy yeah, they done, they done my hair last week. I had my hair yeah. last week, yeah. So is, yeah. It, is it for free, yeah? Yeah, I just did. I, I, I had a really good talk with everyone. They said one of them on my feet, I'm going to do it myself, do something once a week. So, yeah, I'm going to try and do loads of things every day. Yeah. That's what I was like, trying to help everyone. And a crash, and then, yeah, I didn't think about myself for one minute. And because of that, I ended up having a mental breakdown, do you know what I mean? And it's not fun. Got a brother and sister, both younger. You know, we're thankfully, you know, they're not in the same situation as myself. Uh, I first left school, I worked as a slaughterman. Uh, I have got an asbestos removal licence, you know, to remove asbestos. I've done various jobs, warehouse work, labouring. Yeah. All sorts of different jobs over the years. Yeah. Have you got a job now? No. No, you haven't got a job? No. Uh, I was took off about four years old because of abuse, physical and mental, so... Not really any contact with my family. No. Not at all, no. No. Uh, what's your biggest fear in life? I don't have any fears. Yeah. I don't have any fears. I think I've conquered them all, to be honest. Yeah. Oh, hang on. Not being remembered. Not being remembered. By, I, by anybody, just not being remembered. Being forgotten. Uh, Dying on the street. Biggest regret. Uh, not really, not listening, thinking I knew best. Not putting more into my sport when I was a kid. I think homelessness is a really serious problem. Especially on the streets of Manchester, it seems to be growing more and more every day. And as soon as you speak to these people, you realise they have a completely normal life, just, just like you. And then they've missed one payday or one rent due, and then that's it, it's all been gone. And then they're on the streets. Do we feel safe? Funny you say that, last night I was only attacked. We had been split open. And that was, that was just for asking someone for change. They gave me a mouthful, called me all the names under the sun, you know, I was still polite, said to them, thank you, have a good night. I walked off, next minute I was whacked over the head. What makes you feel safe? My fist. <laughs> yeah, council, they took photographs of all my stuff, all my furniture, and they were going to take all my furniture, and my, my daughter went, nah, my mum had me that, my mum said I could have that. But they won't let her keep the house. So have you got any contact with your family? Yeah, I spoke to my mum. I was at my mum's dad's last week, but it kind of went sour grapes. Oh, right. We were homeless on an off for 12 months and it was really tough. 12 months? Yeah, they kept me in the house, they didn't want me out. They locked me in. And I was in there five days and I had to get the police to get out. Um, there's different reasons why people become homeless. Some people uh, become homeless because um, they might lose the job, they might get evicted. Some people also, um, it can be a rebellious thing, like sometimes um, they can, uh, a lot of young ho ho people are homeless because um, they fell out with the parents and what they do is sometimes they can cut their nose off to spite their face. So they say, you know what, well I'm going to live on the streets then and then they go, and sometimes they go that way. What is the hardest thing about being homeless? 
Uh, being ignored, really. Yeah, you know, I know it can be, must be annoying because there's that many homeless people asking for money. But uh, the way they look at you, you know, like, they're just studying you, really. You know, at the end of the day, I prefer them to tell me to F off than ignore me. You know, at least, you know, at the end of the day, I'm still human. Where would you like to be in a deal's time? Like from today, in a deal's time? Uh, in some sort of property. In my own business, running my own business, my own boss. Yeah. What would you like to do? Like, what, uh, what would be the perfect job for you? Children's entertainer. But as in, on a grand scale of things, like, I got the idea from Americans, really. For Americans have, like, you have special guests turn up to birthday parties and stuff like that, like Batman will turn up, or Superman. Yeah. Over here, they don't do that as much. No, you know what I mean? They don't do that, so I want to start it over here. Yeah. And, like, I've, like, but not just do it for kids, I've been doing it for adults as well. So, for instance, I don't know, if you're, like, a big fan of Marilyn Monroe, so turn up to your birthday party <laughs> and sing to you happy birthday. Yeah. Marilyn Monroe, a look like a Marilyn Monroe would turn up to your birthday party and perform happy birthday for you. Uh, but on a guy, all sorts of things, it depends. If you're a Star Wars fan, I'll have Darth Vader turn up to your party. If you're a Bond fan, I'll have a 007 lookalike turn up to your party. So what's your favourite cartoon if you have? Marvel comics, Marvel and DC. Where did you get that? That's pretty cool. Pretty cool time, actually. When did you get that? About two years ago. Two years ago. That's pretty, pretty cool. How much was it? 30 quid, that. 30 quid. Alright. It's DC, that. Yeah, yeah. DC Comics, I'm getting my whole arm done eventually. That's all going to be DC. And that's all going to be Marvel. What do you think are the main reasons people become comics? Uh, the main reasons? Uh, unfortunately, there's there's a great spectre of uh, what I think is a reason to become homeless. Some people, obviously, after after the army, you know, they've kind of maybe they've let themselves go a bit or something, and then they they end up unfortunately in the street. Others, it may have been own own you know kind of fault, but others they may be completely unfortunate. You know, born born that way, born in a certain way where you just have that fate. So. That pisses me off the most, you know what I mean? You've got to carry all your stuff around, you get your stuff nicked in it. It's just a joke. Well, I tried to get you like a sturdy bag to aid with the carrying. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to try and get a little, but they have their um, rucksacks in the sale. Well, that got stolen and all. I bought, I bought a rucksack the other week. Got all my little toiletries in it and that got robbed it off. There's a sleep ball put on. Yeah. Just a joke. But I'm um, a support worker, I'm going to go and see it again tomorrow and she's trying to get me a flat. Yeah. Because I won't go in them bed sits because they're full of drugs and that. They start booting doors in and I, I mentally can't deal with things like that. They've got psychosis in there. Like, I can't deal with things like that. It's too much for my brain. Uh, what is the best thing that happened to you this week? I was finally given an appointment for a mental health. So they might hear to diagnose me with something. Because I've been out of this, work, been going around there in my head like that. And everybody's just saying, no, oh, it's you, Connor. But they've actually turned around and listened to me now and saying, no, I'm, I'm going to there is something actually wrong with your brain. Yeah. Something has slid, something's cracked. So that's made me pretty happy. Yeah. I'm getting took seriously now. So at night, where did you sleep? That doorway there. Closed door. Yeah, it's closed door. On, yeah, on a Sunday it is. So have they ever kicked you out from there? Or? Oh yeah, they yeah. wake you up in the morning because she's got to get in. As soon as you wake me up, I move on. I sit here. So, so they help you and you help them in that way? Like, yeah, yeah, because... They to them or no, 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 because I mean, as soon as they come, they wake me up. Yeah. They say, excuse me, I've got to get in the office. I'm not a problem. Grab my bags and I just move here. And they're like, thank you. And some, sometimes they come out with water and stuff like that. It was really hot. Not today, but yesterday she did. She came out and said, here's a bottle of water. I was like, oh, thank you. Yeah, I mean, she didn't have to. She so could have... Yeah, yeah, she seems all right. Yeah. 
Yeah, she seems all right. I've only been here two or three days, but she seems all right. So when you're not here, where, where, wherever you go? Anywhere around the city. What's your favourite part of the city? I haven't got one. No. no. Yeah, just at the end of the day, you know, I'm still a human being, you know, I don't choose to sit here, you know, sadly it's circumstances that have put me in this situation, you know, I prefer to be working, you know, I, I, do, more, I do more hours a day doing this than a normal job, you know, and I would prefer to, to be in some sort of work, normal work, you know, normal life. I wouldn't wish this on my worst enemy, this, this lifestyle. Have you seen any hell, like, with any government? Uh, I'm not just with the council, but the government think there's no uh, homeless, they say there's no homeless problem. Would you ever give money to the government? I would, yes, indeed. I, Why? Because I, I think it's only fair to help. So, I only think that, well, basically, my, the person who I look up to the most is Michael Jackson, sorry to mention, but I believe following his footsteps, the best thing would be to help others. I think that um, on a daily basis, um, it, can, it, can, it can vary depending because some, some homeless people, um, like there's a homeless man sometimes that you see there, but he's not here today, and he makes like um, ashtrays out of cans, he gets cans off the street, and what he does is he gives out the, um, the cans and asks for a small donation. So it, 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 it depends really, I'm not 100% I'm not sure, but it, it, I think it depends. I think some probably can get about £10, some might make up to £20, some might make up £100. So it depends, it varies.